Nope. We can see you, but not the slides. Okay. We might need to reconnect. Yeah. Okay, let's work. Let's start from. Okay, now it should work. And yep. Okay. Uh, you... Yes, now it is okay. Yes, yes, it took a little bit. And let me move this away from the main screen. Maybe. Okay. okay. Okay, very good. Yeah. So, yeah, before I, I get started, I will, I will try to. Um, the pointer is not really working now. Uh, uh, maybe if you press on the PDF. Yes. Uh, no, okay. It's okay. Good. Yeah. So first of all, I will will start with a brief, very brief uh, historical introduction. Um, semiconductor detectors are not nothing new. Actually, we've been using them for energy measurement since uh, the '60s in the last century. But it was only um, in the late '90s, uh, '70s, sorry, or early '80s where basically making use of the uh, uh, different uh, research lines and developments on, uh, done on the uh, semiconductor um, industry, we were making use of that to actually structure mi microstructure electrodes at a, a certain uh, 50 to 100 micron level. And then this basically improved the uh, position resolution that we could uh, uh, achieve with these uh, detectors down to 10 microns or even below. And having this possibility, actually this opened a new window um, in terms of the, the, the physics reach that we could uh, actually uh, get into, since uh, secondary vertexes of short-lived particles where they're accessible, and you see a nice, nice picture here of the opal detector actually um, um, uh, reconstructing the uh, primary and secondary vertexes of some um, uh, decay. Um, basically, by having this, this opportunity, this, this changed completely the way we did experiments. Um, and as you will see, uh, basically nowadays we have um, basically silicon uh, detectors everywhere in all the uh, high energy physics experiments. So here you have a, a cartoon, uh, basically uh, uh, at the very early stages of our um, experiments, we were uh, basically doing table uh, top experiments. Then uh, the thing got a bit more and more complicated. We went through emulsions and films, uh, learned, uh, um, all the way up to large uh, uh, gaseous detector until uh, we reached this, uh, this uh, period here in 1979. This, was, uh, this is considered to be the birth of semiconductor era. Um, I point you to the original paper here where Joseph Kemmer actually showed how we can build um, um, a, a planar diode using a, a, um, a development done by the semiconductor industry. And then, then basically this was the, the origin of this uh, semiconductor era, as I've mentioned before. Um, so going a little bit more into historical um, aspects, um, I want to show you uh, the, um, uh, uh, let's say the silicon detector that was used in the NA11 experiment at CERN, the end date was uh, um, in 1988. And this was the first position sensitive uh, silicon detector in, in high energy physics. Um, it was, let's say tiny somehow, a few um, uh, square centimeters only with um, a, a little bit more than a thousand um, strips. But actually it showed that the performance could be very good and we achieved a resolution that was better than five microns. I will now jump a little bit and uh, show the, um, um, another example. There is the uh, micro vertex detector of the uh, Delphi experiment. Since this looked already very much uh, to what, um, a bit, uh, what the actual configuration is in, in high energy physics uh, experiments. So we had a long 40 centimeter staves uh, basically in this barrel-like uh, uh, configuration surrounding the uh, uh, beam pipe. Um, and we've basically trying, we were basically trying to put the, all the, uh, let's say, um, non-active material outside of the acceptance regions on the very forward and very backward. And this basically looked like um, a modern experiment already, although the end date was more than 20 years ago. So this brings me to uh, this nice picture that I always like to show, since here you can compare the uh, vertex detector that, that I have shown on the previous slide with the actual uh, tracker of CMS. You see there is quite a difference. Mm -hmm. And this is basically because on the Tevatron era and later on on the LHC, uh, the role of the uh, silicon semiconductor detectors actually changed from vertexing in the origin. And now they are taking um, a leading role also in the, in the tracking part. 
So basically we are covering more and more area with um, many silicon layers. And this is an evolution of the surface. It's a function of the year, um, uh, the, the silicon surface. And you see we, are, we keep increasing um, uh, basically at each experiment. And I don't have to show you that basically we have now silicon everywhere. Since this is the LHC network, I put some, some examples here with the CMS tracker before, but also in, uh, let's say, uh, super flavor factories, we have silicon. And if you have ever done a test beam campaign, you uh, know that basically all the uh, test beam lines available in Europe, at least, are equipped with one of these uh, telescopes that is basically made out of uh, CMOS sensors. And of course, um, since uh, we are in the LHC network, I don't have to tell you that actually uh, looking back on the LHC running, this has been a, a very tremendous success. We are operating our detectors in very harsh environments with large pileup, but with very good performance. And we were um, able to perform beautiful uh, physics results. And I think uh, these achievements have been possible not only, but also due to the extremely well performant um, semiconductor detectors. So with this in mind, um, I think we should, before we, we go into the uh, deep, uh, hardcore, let's say, uh, part of the presentation, I think it's important to understand what is the task of a tracking detector. And for that here, this is a, a cross-section of the Atlas experiment. Uh, this is the interaction point. We have pixels um, then strips, and then we have uh, the transition radiation uh, ga uh, tracker gaseous detector. Um, the role of a tracking detector is to provide um, precise space points or uh, clusters, vectors, originating from ionizing particles to do track finding, momentum determination, since you have a, a B field here, and measuring basically the, the decay vertexes of the uh, primary and secondary particles that are created. And all that has to be done, keeping the material budget down to the minimum levels. I think this is the standard recipe for, for the rest of the talk that you have to, you have to remember. So what's the meaning of having good vertex resolution or good tracking? So imagine that you have, uh, this is the uh, typical uh, configuration. You have a beam pipe, this is the beam axis. You have um, electrons and positrons in this case, uh, smashing at the interaction point. And then you create secondary particles that fly and then thread the decay. Um, and those particles basically interact with our detector material. And then we can reconstruct this, um, uh, these points that are the interaction uh, between the particle and your detector. So if you have this configuration, imagine that you have two layers of pixels, let's say, at a certain radii from the beam axis um, with a certain resolution. The question is, how good can you reconstruct this vertex point? And this is given by this equation. Um, and uh, without going into uh, 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 details, um, the, the, this equation basically puts some uh, requirements on the detector side. Your detector has to have fine segmentation. This is the sigma here. It's basically telling you that you have to put small pixels, for example. You have to be uh, very low on the material side since uh, there is this x over x zero. This also implies all the material that you have in between the decay point and your, the position of your or different layers. You have to be as close as possible to the beam pipe with the innermost layer. This is this R1 minus R0. And you need to have a long lever arm, that is this um, R2 minus R1. So large segmentation, low material, first layer is very close, last layer uh, very far away. Similar goes on the tracking and momentum. Uh, so if you want to have a good tracker, a good momentum resolution, imagine that you have um, a number of, uh, of uh, uh, layers. Um, now this thing doesn't work, okay, here. A number of layers n uh, covering a certain um, um, uh, region at certain distance l immersed on magnetic field. So your momentum resolution is given by two terms. First of all is the point resolution, and then you have the multiple scattering term. And if you look closely at the equation, basically the same recipe as before stands. You need fine segmentation, so your pixel pitch has to be small. You need a large detector. This is this l square here and you need to reduce your material budget. So basically, those are the standard recipes if you want to build a good um, vertex and, and, and tracking detector. So the question is also, yeah, in some detectors, you have seen that actually we used a gaseous uh, detector on the tracking volume. So when to use either a gaseous detector or a semiconductor uh, detector? Um, then here we have to, to actually 
um, a list the advantages or disadvantages of each option. Of course, a gaseous detector adds very low material. You have a lot of uh, measurement points in the order of 100 or more with modest resolution. On the other side, if you have a, a silicon um, a detector, the material is not so good because it's more massive, let's say. You, have, um, you cannot put a lot of measurement points. The position, the resolution of each of the points is actually very good. So in the end, it compensates. You have a lot of points with not so good resolution against with very good resolution and everything more or less the performance is the same. But the main difference between them is the rate or speed capability. So if you have a high track density environment, uh, the only solution that you can uh, afford is a silicon detector. So with this in mind, um, basically let's go and try to explain how a silicon detector works. And I would like to start first showing the schematic principle of a gaseous detector, and I think it's a bit more intuitive. So imagine that you have um, um, a gas volume here. Um, if this works now here. Yeah. So imagine that this is a gas volume and you have uh, two metal electrodes. If a particle comes, for example, an X-ray interacts with the media, you get ionization. Therefore you have electron ion pairs. But if there is no external electric field, basically those charges diffuse and at some point they recombine and nothing happens. So if you want to use this configuration as a detector, what you have to do is to apply some external voltage to your uh, metal plates. Therefore, if the, if the particle comes, you create electron ions in a gas, then uh, since there is an electric field, then the charges drift away. And on the way to the uh, collecting plates, they induce a signal that you can later on process. The working principle with a semiconductor detector is very similar. Instead of having gas, you have silicon, for example, and instead of having electron ions, you have electron holes, but the, 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 let's say the principle basically stands. The um, easiest detector that you can build is a fully depleted uh, PN junction, as you see here. So you have PN junction with an external bias in order to fully deplete the bulk. You get rid of all the free charge carriers that you can have there in, in the volume. And when a particle goes through, you create electron hole pairs. There is an electric field, they drift, and this uh, uh, charges move into the uh, collecting nodes basically induce a signal that you can later on process, amplify, or do whatever you need in your experiments. The typical thickness of this uh, um, um, uh, unit is around 100 to 300 microns. This is the standard values for our applications. So there is a problem though with this uh, PN junction if you have a pad detector, and it's uh, basically the resolution. So um, if you have this configuration, you cannot basically tell um, and, in, and in which uh, direction the particle went through. So if you want to increase the resolution, uh, what you have to do is to actually um, apply some kind of segmentation on, on the sides. The simplest thing you can, you, can, uh, you can actually do is a strip uh, detector. You can see the concept here. You basically microstructure one of the sides uh, with these strips and you connect each of these strips to your readout circuitry. So if you have a signal and this strip, you know the particle went somehow in this direction. But this of course makes a, uh, has a problem. You cannot really tell if the particle went very close or very far on, on, this, on the strip. So the next natural solution would be, okay, let's make a structure, similar structure on the other side, but with a certain angle. So um, you have then therefore a particle going uh, across, you have a signal in this strip, you have a signal on this strip, and basically the position is the point where the two strips uh, cross. But if you have a high track density environment, there are um, some issues, or if you have high noise, there is some kind of confusion term, uh, ghost hits that can appear, uh, but without going into all the details, um, in the end, if you want to have a true two-dimensional information without ambiguities, what you have to do is uh, to go for uh, uh, pixel detectors, and this is basically uh, the configuration. So here, what you have is a 2D array of pixels and each pixel is a PN junction. You connect each of, each of the readout channels to a front end electronics. And then here you have a 2D uh, real information without um, any problems. Okay, so this is the basic principle. And um, here in this slide, I show a bit the uh, family tree of semiconductors. Uh, we can make two big categories, uh, one detectors with avalanche gain or without internal uh, multiplication. 
Um, I will not talk about this kind here, but it's also very trendy, especially for timing applications, but I will uh, concentrate mostly on the second part. Um, and there is no internal multiplication on the silicon substrate, but there, is, there's, there has to be, of course, some amplification at some point to amplify and process the signal. This can be either internal on the surface with some integrated amplifier, and this uh, uh, can be uh, of the variant of, um, let's say, um, um, basically one transistor or multiple transistors with full uh, processing capabilities. And this is what is uh, we call monolithic. Uh, the talk will mostly be about this. Or um, we can also, depending on the configuration, use strips or hybrid pixels, single-sided, double-sided, or uh, planar or 3D. So basically, I will talk about these two parts here and how we can move from hybrid pixels to monolithic pixels, and in which experiment would you use uh, each of them. So um, in the previous uh, slide, I basically showed, as I said, the family tree. And I said, yeah, there is one um, option that is monolithic or hybrid. But actually, the real implementation can be very different depending on the, the particular detector type you're talking. So in terms of a hybrid detector, I will go more into details later on. Hybrid just means that you have a, a sensor and a readout chip interconnected somehow, typically with solar balls, but it can be either with solar balls or with some conductive glue. Uh, you can have many different sensor types, but all of them are called hybrid. But the particular implementation has to be studied in detail. And very similar goes to the uh, monolithic version. The uh, monolithic just means that you have sensor and front-end electronics in one single unit. But the way you implement this is, is, is actually very, uh, depends a little bit on the technology and on the design features. I will be mostly talking about fully depleted uh, monolithic sensors in this talk. So um, now the question is, what are the challenges on the LHC environment um, and how to meet them? And what are the consequences of this, uh, of this um, um, harsh um, operation in this environment? So um, you have to assume that um, with a certain luminosity, let's assume 10 to 34, we have punch codes in every 25 nanoseconds. You assume uh, with a certain cross section that you have this number of tracks in the entire um, uh, solid angle for a, um, a, a given uh, time. And this is uh, something like five to six orders of magnitude what we used to have at, at LEP. So how do you cope with that? Well, the trick is read your detector very fast and add a lot of segmentation. So if you do that, in the end, the occupancy per pixel is dramatically reduced. So if you want to live in this harsh environment, you have to do small pixels and read them very fast. But uh, this number of particles also create another travel that is uh, on the radiation side. So our detectors suffer from radiation damage that can be of two types, um, ionizing dose. This basically damages uh, your transistors and the electronics. And there is what we call the non-ionizing um, energy loss that this breaks the silicon lattice. And this creates some trouble that I will explain later on. So um, for that, you have to do special developments in order to uh, make your sensor and readout electronics radiation hard. So typical situation is, um, this is for the Atlas pixels. Before irradiation, you have a, a 250 micrometer a thick sensor. If your uh, MIP goes across, then you create something like 20,000 el electrons. And with some assumption on uh, noise levels and so on, your typical signal to noise ratio is in the order of 30 or around. So this is a situation before irradiation. You have a certain parallel distribution with a threshold and your signal is well uh, above your threshold. But after irradiation, you damage the bulk, then charges are trapped, and then the consequence is you lose charge, uh, you collect way less, and this has a certain direct impact on the signal to noise ratio. So basically after irradiation, your signal is coming more to your threshold and then the, the, the detector is more difficult to operate, and this may have some consequences on um, efficiency loss and so on. But um, in the LHC experiments, we have demonstrated that this was well taken into account and the detectors are working nicely. We designed the detectors to, to, uh, to work in this environment and we have basically a super high efficiency. And if there, uh, even after the uh, run two, we have most part of the detector operational with good resolution. And 
I've uh, shown um, uh, the family tree, and I said that there is one, uh, let's say, category that is called hybrid. And this is the state of the art in the LAXC experiments. This is uh, uh, an example, a picture of the uh, Atlas insertable B layer. And there we have this configuration that is called hybrid. And as I said before, uh, what we have is a sensor and a readout electronics interconnected with some solder bolts typically. And then if you want to power this, uh, um, this unit or send data out, whatever, then you can do wire bond into another structure and then you have your readout electronics somewhere. So here, what you have, um, each of the channels um, is shown here. This is a cross section. You have your fully depleted sensor. When the particle comes, you create charge, charge carriers that drift, and then our, the signal are basically um, uh, collected and, and amplified and, and processed on the uh, front end electronics that is placed on another independent unit. And as I said, this is the state of the art for the LHC detectors, and we have shown that for example, this is an example of the um, IBL, the uh, uh, heat on track efficiency is very good, um, uh, even for uh, large integrated luminosities. This also couples to uh, the radiation damage. Efficiency is very high, uh, higher than 99% with a very good uh, performance. I also said that um, hybrid just means that you have a sensor of any type interconnected to a front end electronics by some means. And um, I mentioned that the sensor can be either planar or 3D, can also be diamond, can be whatever you want, a CMOS sensor, for example. But I want here to show that actually this is what we do in the uh, um, IBL in Atlas, uh, where we have actually uh, hybrid uh, detectors, but the sensor is of two different kinds. First of all, we have planar sensors here in the very center. And at the very forward and backward, we are using 3D sensors. What is the difference? So in the standard planar configuration, you have these structures on the top and on the bottom side. When the particle goes, the charge carriers basically have to drift all the uh, large uh, bulk volume until they are collected on the electrodes. Um, there is another uh, smarter way of doing that. That is uh, basically drilling uh, pillars on, on the silicon bulk, and then your implants are no longer on the top or on the bottom, but they are all along these pillars. That means that the charges, when uh, they are created, they have to travel less distance until they are collected. So there is a faster response wise. And as a result of that, the uh, trapping probability uh, of this charge uh, to be trapped in the silicon uh, uh, bulk after irradiation is smaller. There is also another good consequence that the uh, depletion voltage that you have to apply um, is smaller since the distance between the electrodes is smaller. Um, and that means that overall, uh, this configuration is more radiation tolerant. Um, it consumes a little bit less power, but of course there is a disadvantage. That is the cost, uh, the complexity of fabrication. And also there is some penalty on the uh, higher capacitance that, uh, the, and, and therefore additional higher noise that you see uh, that you have on these three sensors. So with all this in mind, um, what is the typical track arrangement for a high lumi LHC experiment? This is a, a, a cross section. You have the interaction point here, and then you move uh, radially out. On the innermost pixel uh, layers, if you want to survive in this high track density environment and high irradiation, then you basically have to develop some very specific radiation hard uh, technology. Um, I said that the cost is very high, but since you are very close to the IP, the area that you have to cover is not so large. So this is something you can afford. And as soon as you move out, then you can start using normal, uh, normal hybrid pixels. And on the very uh, last, let's say, layer, you have to cover uh, a lot of um, uh, surface. And the most common technique is to use strips since they are very, let's say, cost effective and very easy to produce to cover these, these large surfaces. But there are also another alternatives, um, especially for the outer layers. If the radiation environment is not so severe, we could um, already start conceiving the using of a monolithic uh, um, technologies for this. And this is what the rest of the talk will be about. So new pixel developments for LHC environment and also beyond. And this is basically the core of the talk. Um, um, one naturally would think that the straight solution would be yeah, instead of having a standard hybrid pixels with a sensor and a front end chip interconnected by some means, 
why don't we basically put everything on the same substrate? I think this has several advantages and I think it is, it's a smart and is uh, what uh, the industry does. So uh, in practice means um, moving from a configuration like this, as I mentioned before, you have a sensor, you have a front end interconnected by some means. Um, with this configuration, you can only get a moderate special resolution, let's say 10 to 100 microns or so. You are limited by uh, your bump bonding technique and et cetera. So there are some limitations. And as you can imagine, since you have two units plus some additional metal layers, the material budget that you introduce with this configuration is in the few uh, percent of X0. There are some disadvantages as well, as I said, high cost, but on the other hand, it's, it's very radiation hard. So we use them for the purpose. If you try to combine these uh, this, uh, two units in, uh, in basically a monolithic uh, detector, then um, you're no longer limited by, by, uh, by the solder poles, then you can uh, do uh, very small pixels. Therefore, you have good special resolution. Uh, since you have one single unit, uh, material budget is also low. But the disadvantage is that this is a commercial process, it's not made to, to be working in radiation um, environment. So you need some modification um, of this structure as it comes from the fab. And then you are also a bit limited by a simpler readout architecture since you have to basically put all your circuitry on the uh, 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 pixel surface. And therefore you cannot do as fancy things as you could on a, on a hybrid based um, sensor. Yep. Okay. So um, I will be talking about maps or DMAPs for the rest of the talk. And DMAPs, DMAPs stands for uh, Depleted Monolithic Active Pixel Sensors. Um, it can be either non-fully depleted and then it's only maps or it can be fully depleted and then we call uh, DMAPs. And the detailed implementation, as I said before, depends a little bit on the technology and on the design. You can be um, implemented using high voltage process or using a high resistivity substrate. So basically the depletion, either you play with the voltage or if you have a high, resistivity, um, high voltage um, um, uh, process, or you put a high resistivity on the bulk and then you play with one on another and you can fully deplete the bulk. So monolithic is because the signal generation and the readout is in one single unit. Active is because you have detection in pixel amplification and processes on the same, uh, processing on the uh, same volume and depleted, as I said, because you can fully deplete the bulk and then the entire uh, detector is basically active for detecting uh, particles. The advantages of this technology is, as I said before, very low mass, small pixels, and you can produce highly integrated modules. And as I said before, um, this is making use of uh, basically commercial uh, technologies. Um, since we are basically just using the uh, uh, sensor technologies that are based on commercial processes. Um, you have seen uh, these vendors many times, uh, TSMC, this is in Taiwan, is the one that makes the, the iPhone cameras. Um, so there are certain advantages of using commercial vendors. Uh, one is reduced cost. They can actually process um, uh, hundreds of wafers per, per hour. Faster turnaround, you, once from the moment you send the design until you get the sensor back is two, three months. And we, you can also make use of the large wafers that they develop. And this is a picture of one of these uh, 12 inches wafers that are available from, from TSNC. Of course, not everything is beautiful. There are also some disadvantages in using this uh, technology. Uh, uh, in particular, there is a limited information on the processing details. Of course, the, the vendors will not tell you doping profiles or how they do certain things because this is a proprietary um, uh, information that they keep for themselves. And also another concern in our community is the long-term support. So we are in high energy physics, a very small customer for them. So if Apple comes and offers to move the technology or the production line to a different thing, then our uh, technology could be discontinued. So sometimes it's, it's better to go for slightly smaller vendors um, and sign a memorandums of agreement for long-term support between uh, the institutes and, and the foundries. So, um, Within the DMAPs, um, uh, depleted, fully depleted or partially depleted monolithic sensors, there are basically two approaches or two different, let's say, design schools. And there is nothing special about FABs here. So um, you can implement either large collection electrode design or small collection electrode design 
in either uh, of the vendors that I said that I've mentioned before. But the difference is in the large collection electrode design, uh, basically what you have is the electronics, the processing electrodes embedded on the uh, charge collection well. Here, this is your charge collection and this is your sensor. This is your PN junction, yeah? So whenever you have um, a particle going through, um, electron hole pairs are produced and the charge carriers moved and are collected into this large collection electrode. There are certain advantages, of course. Uh, first of all, you don't have weak field regions. So the entire bulk is fully depleted and you have a well-defined electric field on the bulk. Uh, the charges uh, have to actually drift a small distance. So since they can be collected at any place inside of this large electrode, and therefore, the trapping probability is smaller. You have well-defined field and uh, charges have to move just a little bit. So this design is intrinsically more radiation hard than the small collection uh, node that I will explain now. Of course, there is some disadvantages as well. Um, and the most, um, let's say, noticeable is the, um, the, basically the capacitance. We are talking about 100 femtofarads or even a bit more. And this has uh, penalties in noise, power consumption, or read out the speed that you can achieve with this design. On the other hand, you have the second, let's say, design school that is called the small collection electrode. In this case, the electronics are placed outside of the charge collection well. So your collection well is here and your PN junction grows uh, between the small collecting node and the epi layer here. Um, there are disadvantages, uh, of course, with this design that you may have uh, some uh, non-well-defined electric field or weaker electric field on the periphery of the pixel. Um, so therefore in this design, radiation hardness needs improvements, but we have a solution for this. This is just the, let's say the fir first um, small collection node um, layout that we have produced, but there are certainly uh, good advantages and, and namely um, very small sensor capacitance. So it's uh, 20 times smaller than in this configuration. Therefore, with this design, you can have very low noise, low power consumption, and you can achieve higher um, uh, readout speeds compared to the large collection. Um, so with this in mind, let's, let's go to, to the different portfolio of high energy physics experiments uh, that we are working on and try to understand which uh, detector type of the ones I've mentioned would you use on, on the different um, um, environments. Uh, starting from the LHC, it's clear uh, the state of the art, as I said before, with these harsh environments is hybrid pixels for the innermost layers, and then large area strips for the outer layers of the uh, tracking system. If this is true for the um, LHC, it's even more true for the high Lumi. And I think the only solution that we have there is uh, hybrid pixels again, but making the detectors even more radiation hard and faster readout electronics. But there is a, a large a number of applications where um, those are in need of much less material budget and much higher resolution. Um, and in this case, although in some cases, for example, for the Bell upgrade, we are um, closing, <laughs> we are approaching the uh, uh, harsh condition of the um, outer uh, pixel layers of the uh, high Lumi LHC. Basically, we are um, uh, sure that we can use monolithic pixels uh, for when uh, the environment is not that harsh, but you need much better performance. But actually using um, uh, uh, DMAPS uh, sensors or CMOS sensors in high energy physics is nothing new. We've been, using, uh, we've been using this for quite a while already. And the first good example is the uh, heavy flavor uh, tracker um, on the upgrade of the XTAR experiment at RIC. Uh, that uh, as you see here, this was the first time we used uh, MAPS, in this case, Mimosa 28, implemented in 0.35 micron technology that operated for, um, for um, a couple of years. Here you see one of the staves with 10 of these uh, Mimosa 28 uh, uh, chips put uh, operated together. And there you see many, many staves um, in the final experiment. Uh, this uh, uh, sensor had a very uh, small pixel pitch, uh, around 20 times 20. We achieved a very good uh, hit resolution with very low material budget. Um, of course, um, the, the price to pay in order to keep the power consumption low was to increase the integration time. So in this case, it was rather slow, let's say. Um, but another very good advantage, as I said before, of using commercial processes is that 
since the detector was not very radiation hot, we basically produced three copies of this object from the star. So basically every time the detector was damaged, we just replace it and put a fresh, a new one. And I think this is something that you can only afford if, um, if, you, um, uh, if the cost of your silicon, let's say, is not, is not very extreme. But I think the, uh, basically the, the very good example of the use of monolithic technologies is the ALICE um, uh, ITS2. It's the first CMOS-based tracker on the LHC environment. Uh, this is uh, already quite a large object. We have more than 10 square uh, uh, meters there. They are based on high resistivity epilayer maps. Uh, the chip is called Alpi and has been implemented in tower just 108 nanometer technology. And here you have a picture of the chip, uh, very small pixel pitch as well, extremely good resolution with very low material budget. And here it was basically designed to uh, uh, have a very low power consumption that you can even air cool um, uh, if you're in need to. And of course the, the, the price to pay is this slightly, a little bit um, a long integration time of around 10 microseconds. Going a little bit more into the uh, details of the Alpine sensor. Um, as I said, uh, this is done, uh, this is implemented in 180 nanometer technology and it's of the small electrode design that I've mentioned before. So we have uh, the full uh, CMOS circuitry available, but decoupled from the um, small uh, collection node. And here in this particular design, uh, the bulk was not entirely depleted. So there were some uh, depleted regions. Uh, here in these regions, the charges are um, collected by drift. But then uh, in the rest of the epi layer, when you don't have a, a good, a well-defined electric field, especially at the um, edge of the uh, pixel, then you had some uh, component um, on diffusion. I will come to this, uh, this uh, later since there is a new iteration that it's fully depleted and I will show a bit of technological details. And uh, basically here, this is, you have um, an artistic view of two times two uh, pixels. I just want to say that on top of the epi layer, you have seven meta layers available from the vendor. And this gives you a lot of flexibility also in case if you want to connect using the last meta layer to a redistribution layer um, and read your signals out. So as I said before, we have a solution already. So this is the Alice design. Um, this is not fully depleted. There are in particular the edges of the pixel. Uh, the electric field is not that strong. So you had a, a kind of a diffusion component here at the edges. But um, we wanted, uh, starting from this uh, well-proven design from Alice, try to do something that could work in a more harsh environment of Atlas. Or for example, this is the baseline also uh, for the uh, CMOS um, um, upgrade uh, detector plant for uh, Bell in 2026. Um, and we could do that because we, uh, we basically um, offered um, a number of, of solutions to the vendor and in cooperation with them, we found a solution to modify the process and add an additional planar A-type implant deep down here. And in this case, your PN junction is no longer coming from the small electrode to the epi layer, but comes from this large um, N-type implant to the epi layer. So now here you see that actually the entire bulk is, is fully depleted. Um, you can even enlarge the depth of the epi layer up to uh, 40 microns. So you can actually have 40 microns um, uh, a volume to, to actually create charges. So it's, it, this is also good. And by doing that, by having uh, this additional implantation here, we managed to um, uh, dramatically improve the charge collection time. That was around 30 nanoseconds in this case, uh, mean up down to uh, less than one microsecond in this particular. This um, all together with the um, small uh, uh, thin oxide that is uh, available in this technology, these two facts together, uh, basically um, the consequence is that um, um, we have improved uh, the radiation hardness by one order of magnitude. And now with this design, we, the detector is still operational up to 10 to the 15 uh, fluid levels. So um, there is a solution and there is constant cooperation with the foundry to modify the process. And if you have a specific application, there is always a way out for it. Good, so far I've been talking a lot about the sensor, but um, since I was in charge of, of, of this piece here, um, in Japan, I would like to say that um, usually the sensor is the easiest part and what everybody wants to do. 
And this was the bell case, for example. We started with a very beautiful all silicon leather, 75 micron thick, very nice. You start to put um, basically many layers all together, and then you put uh, your support structures and everything and the cooling, and then you put all the cables out. And what I want to say is that usually the sensor is the easiest and the integration is typically the most problematic part, uh, typically because it comes always at the very late. Um, so I would like to say that sensor design is, is very attractive, but um, you also better consider uh, integration from the very early stages of the uh, development. And um, I want to finalize trying to understand, you know, we have this piece with a lot of material in the end, but um, what is the goal and, and what do you have to do on the design to achieve the minimum material in the end? And I think this is a, a very good example from, from, that I took from, from the ITS2. This is the uh, distribution of material budget as a function of the azimuthal angle. And if you look closely, the silicon part here uh, contributes only uh, a fraction to the total uh, uh, material. So the question is, what, what can I do if you want to get rid of the um, other contributions? So one obvious thing is, yeah, there is water here and is this bluish part here. And this corresponds to the position of the cooling pipes. So if you want to get rid of it, then obviously what you have to do is to reduce the power consumption, the power consumption of, your, of your sensor. If you do that, then you can get rid of the active cooling. Then your situation is much better. So what is next? Uh, actually, next is um, aluminum and kapton. So this is for sending, uh, basically, uh, biasing the sensors, um, sending uh, clock command signals and reading data out. So if you manage somehow to integrate these uh, lines into a redistribution layer on the sensor itself, making use of the uh, post-processing technologies that is available in the market, then good thing is you can also get rid of the Capton cable as well. Then what is left is uh, carbon and glue, and this is for the supported structures. And again, if you can make use of the post-processing op options on the different vendors, then you can use the silicon itself as a supporting structure. And then in the end, you can get rid of the uh, mechanical support. Mm -hmm. And when, I mean, on our side that we do um, instrumentation, basically this is our goal. Try to make a detector that is just pure silicon, everything is active, and that's it. You don't need anything else. But of course, this is not easy. Um, and there is always a compromise. Yeah, and this is what we can say is, is, is squaring the circle. Um, and the trick comes because, as we said before, we would like to have um, high trackers. For that, you need small pixels, you need thin sensors, and you want to read them fast. But having a small pixels, that means that for covering the same area, you have to put a large number of channels that you want to read fast. That means you need to burn more power. If you burn more power, then you have to put cooling pipes. And then actually you add maybe even more material than what you have at the beginning by just maybe putting the smaller pixels, but reading a little bit slower. So overall, I think you have to think in your particular application and you have to uh, find the right balance. And, and in the end, uh, some compromises have to be made. You cannot push in all the different fronts. Um, yeah, I was very biased, I think, towards uh, CMOS sensors. Um, but um, it's not that it's this also my preference, is that if you also look at the um, ECFA, European Committee for Future Accelerator Detector R&D Roadmap, there um, we have put together the, uh, the needs for the vertex and tracker detectors for uh, the different experiments, very close upgrades up to the very far end of uh, FCCHH or whatever. Um, and the different points means that, uh, yeah, it could be nice to have, or if this doesn't happen, then we cannot do the physics. And as you see, there are basically a lot of red dots in position, material budget, power, high rates, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and as I said, I'm very biased towards the CMOS uh, uh, part, but actually this is also recommended in the um, ECFA roadmap on the detector research and development themes. Uh, if you go to the four points that the ECFA recommends to develop on the solid state uh, technologies, you have basically four points. One is CMOS pixel sensors. Second is timing. Third is a radiation hardness. And fourth is trying to improve interconnection techniques such that the uh, 
the, the boundary between hybrid and monolithic is, is no longer that, that, that strong. And this is the recommendation, the four points for to develop on the next decades. So in the future, soon in the ITS3 or Bell 2 um, upgrade or in the Higgs factories, you will start uh, uh, seeing things like that. Um, large wafer sensors uh, making profit on these uh, large wafers, smaller, smaller feature sizes, lighter or even no supported structures. This is the ITS concept that the, 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 the silicon, the sensor itself is so thin that you can bend. And therefore, there is no additional support structure needed or um, innovative geometries, as I said, is curled, the very thin sensors on Capton or very large uh, self-supported um, uh, silicon detector units. And with this, I would like to conclude. I think, uh, yeah, CMOS trackers in high energy physics are now mainstream. Uh, the very good example is the ALICE um, ITS in the LHC, but there are also some um, other very good examples. This is a very serious um, possibility for upgrades on LHCB, Bell upgrade, and for sure in the new machines in Higgs factories in the future. There is a strong interest um, in the community to fully exploit uh, DMAPs and semiconductor trackers, and in particular, uh, CMOS technology, I think are, are here to stay. And with this, yeah, I would like to just thank you very much again for your attention. Okay, thanks. We have time for questions. Uh, you were really sharp on the schedule, 45 minutes for your talk, because we started five minutes late. I think we're gonna give priority to people uh, in the video conference to make questions first. Is there anybody in Zoom that wants to make a question? May I? Yes. Okay. So uh, thank you very much for this uh, pedagogical introduction and trying to avoid uh, three-letter acronyms as much as possible. Uh, so I, I wanted to ask you something about the detectors in relation with the future colliders and future technologies. And the, the thing that worries me, and I want to know if this is an ingredient that is being considered, is acceleration. For instance, I know that this awake thing that CERN that hasn't quite fulfilled its name yet, but if the acceleration technologies change in the future, is this a new game? For instance, because you have much less pileup or radiation, so you, your baseline is current technology or are you also factoring in the fact that uh, humankind, mankind will develop better technology? So that, that's my question. How does this fit a role there? Maybe you don't even care. No, no, no. Of, of course we care. Um, yes, I mean, in the end, um, at the first approximation, we only care about, let's say, occupancy and radiation. So we don't really care much about, um, you know, the, what the, the, the accelerator does. But of course, there is a very important point that is the machine detector interface. So we have to really know how, you know, they would like to implement this um, um, and, and how to make our detector space that we have for routing our cables out, um, optimal geometry for avoiding maybe certain corners where hotspots are created if there is beam halo going somewhere or where to put the collimators and how this can influence our design. So, yeah, I mean, this has certain influence, um, but I think this is more, uh, will come more when you have to design your specific application, let's say. In this particular case, we are basically developing the best detectors that we can. And then this goes more, a little bit, as I said, on the more application, more machine detector interface part. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Uh... In the video conference? Yes, Hector, yes, please. Uh, hello, thank you very much for the nice talk. Um, uh, actually, um, well, I'm working in the nuclear uh, area and actually, um, nuclear physics, actually, um, we plan to use these alpine detectors for uh, some uh, new implementation of trackers around uh, our target in experiments in, in GSI infer in the new facility. Actually, what I'd like to know is if this implementation that includes uh, this hybrid or in particular this monolithic uh, um, reduces somehow the efficiency and at what level the, the efficiency of the detector is, is reduced by the implementation of these additional layers of uh, uh, electronics, which makes uh, um, amplification or, or uh, whatever it does for, for the buffering of the data. 
Ah, for the buffering, you mean? Ah, yeah, okay, this is a very good point. Yeah, depends a bit on, yeah, I think your, your question is, I mean, I need a lot of time to answer that. So in principle, um, there is, or there should be no penalty in terms of detection efficiency if you do the design properly. So as I said, for example, if your detector is not fully depleted, if you have a lot of uh, bulk damage, let's say, then this will certainly have a penalty because then your signal to noise ratio suffers. And then this in the end has uh, certain implications on the efficiency. Um, something that I didn't mention in your particular application, if we talk about uh, yeah, CVM, for example, uh, this detector has a very, let's say, particular implication. So it will be operated in vacuum. So, yeah, heat, uh, removing the heat has also some consequences, but something that I think it has not been uh, completely demonstrated, at least for example, in our case uh, for Bell, it's uh, about single event upsets and how uh, the circuitry on top of the CMOS sensors would behave under heavy ion um, irradiation, for example. So single event effects could be a concern. So you have to do proper, uh, let's say, um, electronics design. And then the other question is about, yeah, bandwidth. Uh, this, yeah, of course, this, you have to take this uh, into account since your processing capabilities may be a bit more limited on the CMOS sensors, but also, um, especially you have a limited buffer that you can send the data out. So yeah, you have to design your integration time and pixel pitch such that your occupancy is low enough that you can do in pixel discrimination and that your data out somehow is not too big. I don't know if I answered the question, but it's, it's actually a, it's a tricky one, but there are many, many considerations, both on the design, on the sensor electronics and on the data transmission out that you have to, you have to consider. And then of course, there is another part that typically the power consumption um, depends also on the occupancy of the sensor. So if your occupancy is very high, then you burn more power and then, yeah. Yeah, there are a lot of, a lot of implications. Yeah, you have to do careful design, yes. Yeah, thank you. I think we are gonna have a lot of fun with that. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. I see many people from the nuclear group at Big Five connected in the Zoom. So if you, after the meeting, want to come and say hi to Carlos, please feel free. Sure, sure. Um, any other questions from Zoom? If not, we can open questions in the room. So any question in the room? Okay, Abraham. Uh, I will ask you about the detector, particularly is the IVL at Atlas and uh, the 3D part. And after one, two, and all the radiation that have been accumulated, uh, how much the depletion voltage increase? And if that is following the prediction or so on. I cannot answer right away, uh, but yes, um, after irradiation, we have to adjust high voltage, of course, and then we have to adapt the thresholds in order to recover efficiency again. Maybe you have seen in the plot that actually the efficiency was going down, and then at some point it kicks up again. And this was due to the fact to adjusting HB and uh, decreasing the thresholds. So yes, we have seen the effect. Um, Can you repeat well with the question because uh, Emma sorry, says that- ah, okay. Uh, yeah, the question was about um, um, efficiency on the IBL after the round two, how much uh, was the bulk damage and how did we have to adjust the HB and the thresholds to recover efficiency again? So you have the question after the answer. Okay, yeah. Uh, any other questions? Any, anywhere in the room or in... Uh, Pablo has one question. Can you please? Oh, I can repeat. Cloud or, well, can I can repeat the question? Yeah. Why do you do not consider the depth for the upgrade of, of the Bell 2? Yeah, the question is at the moment on, on Bell 2, uh, for the two innermost layers, we are using the depth fed technology. Um, yeah, it's, it's for a number of reasons, actually. Um, so the idea that we have uh, at the moment is, is try to get rid of the Two systems, PXD and, and SBD. So there is no, not much sense of, of having uh, two technologies uh, makes uh, operation complicated. So if there is technology that can 
you know, be used for all, I think this would be, this would be great. So in principle, this um, limits somehow the option of, of FETs for the outer layers since you are limited to the six inches wafers that you can produce on, on the HLF. Then also it's a bit expensive and the production time is actually quite long. It's, it's something like 18 months or so. So making iterations um, and um, having large throw output is it's, it's difficult. And then in the end, um, you are somehow limited by the readout speeds that, that you can achieve. So in depth fed, um, in the PXD, you have to go rolling shutter mode. Of course, you can build a hybrid with depth feds as well, but then the material is, is not really you know, what, what we need. So you are limited by rolling shutter mode. And even if we add additional metal layers, um, I think the maximum speed we can get is in the order of one, two microseconds or so. And at the moment we are considering the Monopix uh, chip, that it's an evolution of what I've shown here for, for the Atlas development. So we have an additional implantations for even having better electric fill on the corners and so on. And we can read this device in 25 nanoseconds or so. So we can get smaller pixels, super high speed. Yeah, it's cheap. Uh, you can make big, uh, uh, big uh, structures out of that. I think this would be, I think a better solution also. As I said, in terms of, um, of um, operation later on, instead of having two crews, one for the pixel and the other for strips, you can basically merge uh, both communities. And then in, in long-term operation, I think this may also have some benefit. Uh, okay, there is another question in the room from Eliseo. Well, this is a curiosity concerning these 3D sensors with P and M columns. Yes. As they are, let's say, intrinsically mechanically weak because you have these columns, so it's difficult to make them to have large detectors, to make them planar. So, right now, which is the maximum size, let's say that. Oh, I cannot answer that question. Um, I think people. somewhere, uh, yeah, in the community, I think you can answer. Maybe, Sebastian, what is the maximum size you can produce uh, reliably uh, 3D sensors? Or maybe someone from CNN. Yeah. Um, Julia is connected, I think. But yeah, right now we're doing uh, uh, yeah reliable. I mean, the, the yield is lower than planner, right? But but if, if you're willing to... So right now, the, just to give a benchmark, the, the target is typically a 50 percent yield and the size of the of the devices is two by two centimeters okay so, so yeah you, you can imagine that you can go larger but then the yield will be lower right? which is the pitch the pitch and is the pitch? The, 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 the okay so it's 50 by 50 microns or 25 times 100. Yeah, something I didn't mention is the stitching and connecting verticals. I mean, in industry, in the end, you're limited by your implanter and your uh, yeah, processing capabilities and masks and so on. So you're limited by a certain yeah, two times three square centimeter or so. So if you want to build large sensors, then you have to develop additional techniques to interconnect sensors to each other and so on. But this is another field of, of its own. So. So I see in the video conference, Sebastian raised her hand. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So, so just maybe Carlos, you can comment. So one thing that's always worrisome with with uh, with depth, uh, sorry, with D maps is the the the, the, the dependence on the on the process of the on the foundry, right? You mentioned that there is this modified process, uh, towers and so on, but of course, if if a foundry loses interest then doesn't work you mentioned this and to work with with you know one strategy could be to to work with smaller foundries but of course they are not really committed right so so how i mean what do you think i mean could one strategy could be maybe to change to to, to be able to 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 go to another foundry in a, but, but that typically takes a long time right so what what is your feeling there right yeah um, i have the feeling that I mean, we've been using, um, we've been in contact um, for with with El Foundry and, and Tower Jazz for for a long time. Um, also, in in the context of RD50, for example, or or in, in in other projects, my feeling is El Foundry will discontinue the 150 nanometer line soon, and they will not accept uh, further submissions. Um, of course, there are other alternatives like TSI. Um, we can adapt our process. 
Um, it seems Tower Jazz is more, it's a small foundry. It's more committed to long-term uh, support for high energy physics, but I think it would be nice if the community can somehow maybe, you know, come all together and sign an agreement with big labs like CERN, for example, that we have an MOU between CERN and the partners and, and the foundry that they can give long-term support. But I don't know. Um, a good, a good advan a good plan, for example, in, in Alice, they are directly moving to 65 nanometer technology. And I think this has a longer lifetime somehow. Um, also, it's using TSMC, but as you know, the foundries are really pushing for you know smaller and smaller feature sizes. So I think this is a concern. I, I don't have a way out. I think it would be nice if we could, as a community, try to push big labs, as I said, with different institutes to sign MOUs with maybe Tower, for example, to, to really make sure that we have long-term support for that. But yeah, it's a concern. So yeah, one option would be to use, you know, smaller feature sizes, as, as I said, but um, yeah, it's more expensive. So actually it's something that submission can be like four times more expensive. Um, and this is something our community cannot, cannot really afford. Um, so going for smaller feature sizes and trying to follow the uh, uh, you know the interest of the uh, commercial part somehow is not easy for us. So yeah, I didn't answer the question, but I don't I don't have a good a good solution. As I said, I would be in favor of an MOU with a foundry with a certain feature size that they can actually support for for a long time. Yeah, fair enough. Thanks, Carlos. Okay, uh, I see Edgar has another question. I just let me point out that the red LHC, the network has a um, technology workshop that will happen sometime. Maybe Carmen, who, uh, who has to go right now, <laughs> uh, can make a little bit. I understand, I understand here. What was the uh, question? I, I feel that there is need for people to meet in person. The, the last one was only. Um, in video conference, and I think uh, yeah, well, for, when there we, is when we was talking about instead to be a, a big workshop as the previous one because we cover a lot of subjects, just to concentrate in a few subjects that people are more interested in and to give time for the discussion. So we have to decide which subjects were interesting, and, and, and I believe this is one of the subjects that there is a lot of people interested in. So select these subjects and just to make a couple of workshops during the year. So, but the, the group of the people in charge of the, the organization of the technological workshop is uh, thinking about that. So we have also a question from Edgar, just that. Sorry, now I have to go, sorry. No problem. Thanks, Carmen. Okay, so maybe a question that is the concern, let's say, in, the, in maps, that is the radiation heart. You know what is the state of art to to really cover the the upgrades the the future upgrades to for in terms of radiation. What do you mean, the radiation levels we expect, or yeah, to reach a higher radiation levels? Is, yeah. is there any modification on the technology that could uh, approach? I don't know, for example, the the bellow approach of nest upgrades, let's say, or something like that. There, there is an option on the the maps. On the technology side, you mean? Yeah. Yes, of course. Yeah. Um, I mean, you can go through the backup slides, and I have, uh, you know, a lot of details on further modifications that we have done uh, together with the foundry. Um, but yes, yes, we have solutions, and and this device can. I mean, it was proven to keep good efficiency up to let's say ten to the fifteen one MeV Newton equivalent levels, um, and in the order of hundred megawatts or so should be intrinsically radiation hard, but. Um, but as I said, in the backup, I have a lot of a lot of details about further modifications, how to improve the lateral field, um, faster collection time, and there have been a lot of a lot of studies. And now we have the Malta Monopix two production uh, with uh, different, um, um, let's say, design variants that we are testing at the moment, and they all seem to work fine. So we are working on that. Uh, there is a lot of uh, simulations done. Um, and knew it to prove that actually we have a solution for for high radiation levels. Yes. What about single event? Uh, this is uh, this can is what I what I said. Yeah. Yeah. The question is about uh, single event uh, effects. 
Um, this is a concern, yeah? This is actually on the um, um, actual um, Bell 2 vertex detector, we, we did not really, you know, took seriously enough. Um, for the moment, luminosity is not that high, but we start seeing single event sets from time to time. So you have to take also this into account in your design. You have to add redundancy, hummingbird encoding, uh, blah, 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 whatever. So there are means for doing that, but uh, yeah, in particular heavy ion irradiation, this is something we would like to do. Possible latch ups, uh, things in the memory, uh, corruption. Yeah. Yes, this is, a, this is something we should study further, I think. Okay. I think it's time to wrap up. Uh, if there is not very urgent questions, uh, additional questions, <laughs> I propose we uh, thank Carlos again for this very nice talk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, maybe just to let you know if you want to propose a seminar, there are, there's a list of seminars that uh, are pending and there will be a seminar in January. But if you feel that you have a seminar that you want to propose to the Red LHSC, uh, send Isidro Gonzalez on Oviedo, who is the chair of organizing these seminars, uh, an email, or anyone could be also Carmen or myself. Uh, the idea is that you invite someone that you want to network with uh, to discuss and to host at your institute uh, and has to be related to LAC physics. Uh, so think about it. And thank you everybody for connecting and thank you everybody for attending in the room. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye.